Happy Friday, everyone. Thank you very much for joining us today for a very special treat a conversation with Mr. Bob Woodson. Um, we are coming up on the end of the year. It is the time of the year when we um, are entering the most hopeful season of the year. And we certainly do have a great deal of hope for our state and country going forward. But we've also, we recognize that the last couple of years in particular have been a, a season of uncertainty. It's been a, a season of anxiety in this country, great divisiveness. Uh, and that, that uncertainty has caused people to ask a lot of questions about our country and where it's headed, the trajectory of America. Um, if in fact we are becoming a more perfect union and there are a lot of uh there are a lot of opinions about what causes this country to become a more perfect union and what what are the challenges to that movement in the right direction uh, I, i've often found in my own life in times of uncertainty i i get a lot of um stability in my thinking when i listen to people that have great wisdom and who have experienced things that I have not experienced. And certainly Mr. Bob Woodson is one of those men who has lit, who have lived through a great deal of Americans uh, of America's most recent history, uh, a, a air for an air force veteran, a civil rights activist, someone who is a voice for the underserved, uh, someone who is an important American thinker, and Bob, we are very grateful to have you today. I'll, I'll, I'll start off by saying that uh, you have recently compiled in your book, Red, White, and Black, which is a book that's just recently been released. And it's a compilation of stories, uh, the subtitle, Rescuing American History. Um, tell us a little bit about your perspective, given your experience as, as living through the civil rights movement and actually living through America's history for the past however many years you've lived it. Uh, give us your perspective <laughs> on, on this country and its possibilities for being a more perfect union and why we should move in that direction and what keeps us from going that way. Well, thank you, Governor. It really is a pleasure and an honor to share this time with you um, as you said, I'm a veteran of the civil rights movement, but I was born during the depression in a small uh, and, and segregated Philadelphia. People don't realize how they were. But throughout that time in this small uh, blue collar enclave in South Philadelphia, 95% of all households had a man and a woman raising children. Uh, all of the stores in the communities were owned by blacks. I never heard a gun fired. From, from the time I was from a K through 12, um, elderly people could walk safely in those communities without fear of being mugged by their grandchildren. Uh, children were not shot in their cribs as we do today. So even under the worst of conditions in America, um, communities, black communities and others thrived. And, um, but, and, and, and as I said, when we fought in, in the civil rights movement, we were fighting to make America a more perfect union. Dr. King said uh, that it is important that we be judged by the content of our character. And so we, what we were demanding at that time was for, uh, for opportunities to be opened up and, and, and to be judged by the content of our character. And, and we thought with the, uh, the very fact that when o uh, President Obama was a candidate, Obama, we thought that we were now ready to move beyond the civil rights to a post-racial America. And I remember in his classic speech when he said, we're not a black America or a red America or a white America. We are all a united America. And, and, and 80 million uh, Americans voted for the first black president in, in, in the history of the nation. And unfortunately, the first time he got confronted with a pushback from the civil rights leadership because of his speech at Morehouse College, where he encouraged black men to be responsible fathers. He, 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 he got a great blowback. Instead of standing up for those principles, he retreated 
to the point where saying when Trayvon Martin died, well, he could have been my son. And from there, uh, we have just seen a deterioration of, of, of the race issue in America. And, and, of, uh, and of late, it's even gotten worse because uh, people who are hostile to the values of this nation, who have then used the rich legacy of the civil rights movement to denigrate that, and this was expressed in 1619 with the New York Times, uh, Nicole Hannah-Jones and a group of other black journalists got together and published 1619, which was really a, uh, a, a, an attack on the fundamental values of the nation. And what they are saying is that because of America's birth defect of slavery, that 1619 is when the first 20 African slaves arrived on a shore that America should be forever condemned by its birth defect of slavery. And therefore they went beyond to say that capitalism is also complicit in, in, in oppression. And so since they, they were using uh, blacks as the messenger, we at the Woodson Center felt that the messengers to counter that should also be led by blacks and so we assembled not just black scholars and, and active, but activists, but also we are a, a, a mixture of different ideologies, different people coming together, not to engage in more gladiatorial combat, but to offer a more hopeful, a more accurate portrayal of America. We are patriots uh, seeking to tell the truth. And Governor, it is my belief that we must proceed on fact-based truths, otherwise lies become normal. Uh, I, I think you're right. I, I, um, I'm a strong proponent of <clears throat> providing opportunity for people and recognizing that America ha has a great promise of opportunity for all people. In spite of the fact that there are barriers that we have to remove so that people can access that promise. Uh, I remember um, my wife and I visiting the Civil Rights Museum in Memphis and just looking at historical barriers that existed throughout that civil rights movement and how those barriers were removed, it, it has made me, uh, in the role that I'm in, it's made me think about how it is that we can give our children in particular, and especially those that are, that have more barriers than others, how we can give them opportunity. And, and a lot of that is what we teach our kids about this country and what's available to them through this country. Not, not so much, not as much about what's wrong with this country, but what's right about it to inspire them to access that promise of America. Um, with, you know, Tennessee's been recognized as one of the top five states for civics education, and we created the governor civic seal. And I believe that America is the greatest nation in the world, in spite of our flaws, that we are becoming a more perfect union. But we have to educate our children on the uniqueness and the exceptionalism of our nation. And we do, throw, do so through civics education. I, I think if we do that, all children, especially children that are underserved, that are that lack privilege, that have barriers, they can be inspired to recognize that they too can access that promise. Uh, g give me your thoughts just a little bit about what is the promise of America, okay. and and what does that look like for a young black kid in in Memphis, for example. I think, first of all, and for those of us who support the, the founding virtues and values of the nation, it is important for us to be candid and acknowledge that some of the criticisms coming from, our, from the detractors are, 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 are de well-deserved criticisms, particularly among my conservative colleagues, I've said, um, because the fact is that we have not really been candid about talking about slavery and how cruel and vicious and it was. For instance, I spoke uh, at, a, at a conservative gathering last week and I, it was refreshing because the person introducing me acknowledged that in 1978, the, the state of Virginia 
required all schools to use textbooks exclusively produced by the state. And for 20 years, those textbooks portrayed slavery as a benign institution, almost like a welfare system where people were happy and content and, and, and also, uh, and so that is what we, we did. And it's, it's important if we're going to speak with moral authority uh, 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 against it, we have to acknowledge that that is true. And so it, but, but we do not want to replace a revisionist history with another revisionist history. And what the left is trying to do is because of the failings of the past, they want to forever to define this nation, nation by our, our, our shortcomings and our birth defect. So what we need to do though, and that's what we're trying to do at the Woodson Center, is that we, we are, they are, we are attack, uh, attacking their basic premise. They're saying that the 70% of out of wedlock births in the black community today, uh, the high unemployment, the violence, all of these are the legacy of slavery and discrimination. And the reason why these conditions were created and persist is because of systemic racism. Well, this is not true. And so we document in these essays when blacks were at, when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. Uh, we did surveys, uh, one of our scholars, looking at the state of the black family after slavery was over. And looking at the records of six plantations, 75% of black families had a man and a woman raising children in slavery. For 100 years, <clears throat> this tradition of two parent households continued. Um, we only 20% of blacks were literate at the end of slavery, but because of their own institutions in the black church, that number increased to 70% in less than 50 years. Nowhere in the history of the world has a people able to make such strides in the presence of oppression. So the, even in 1930 to 1940, the black, uh, when racism was enshrined in law, black America had the highest marriage rate of any group in society. Elderly people could walk safely in their communities because of their Christian values, because their belief in self-determination. Uh, we had 20 blacks who were born slaves who died millionaires. So capitalism has been the principal engine that enabled blacks to create wealth and prosper in the face of oppression. So our children, both black and white, need to be told the truth about the American experience, warts and all. But people are inspired, Governor, to improve themselves when you show them examples of victories that are possible, not constantly reminding them of injuries to be avoided. We have what, what I call crucifixionists on the left and resurrectionists on the right. <laughs> and the resurrectionists on the right want to discount the crucifixion. And so what we believe, you must tell the crucifixion and the resurrection. That's the complete story. And that's the American story is, is, we are, or is redemption. That none of us, either as individuals, a community want to be judged by the worst of what we were as a young person. How many watching this broadcast wants to be judged by the worst thing we ever did as a young person? America is a country of redemption of second chances. And we need to be focusing on accurate history of what we did, how we prospered in the face of oppression, and how we can then use those values and apply them to a new vision. You spoke a little bit a few minutes ago about the institution of the black church. And, um, <clears throat> and you also talked about being, you know, being truthful in our understanding of our history in the past. And I, I'm a guy who has a strong interest in the role of the faith-based community in our society. We, we all, we opened an office of, faith-based and community initiatives here, because I, I don't believe that government is the answer to the no. greatest challenges that we have. I think that government and, and government institutions oftentimes 
exacerbate this entire problem that we have with um, with opportunity and incentives and inspiration for people to engage in the American dream. I do believe that the more I have learned as I as I engaged in understanding what happened in the 50s and 60s and 70s, the white church, especially in the South, was not, uh, if if truth be told, in many instances, they were they were not the institution that was advocating for change. And that's part of the truth that has to be uh, that has to be understood as we move through this. And and the black church, in fact, had institutions within its belief system that contributed to the nuclear family and to the prosperity of uh, African-Americans, even in the midst of what some would call oppression of those days. And what was oppression in those days? What is the role what is the role of the church today? Uh, and, I, and I don't, you know, I, I think the church today is not nearly a black church and white church as it was, although it, it is still very much a segregated institution for the most part. But, but nevertheless, there's a great desire among many people in the faith community to be part of the answer going forward to to provide real solutions and to provide supports and to provide hope in the midst of some of these challenges. What talk a little bit to me, talk a little bit to us about your, your thoughts on the role of the faith-based community. Well, it, it, it was, as I said, when I mentioned earlier about how the, uh, the, the important role that the church uh, played in setting up Sabbath schools, when, when slaves were freed from the plantations and they could not read, it was the black church uh, that provides Saturday schools where they taught blacks to read and, and help maintain. And that's why we were able to reduce the, 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 the that, that. Also churches were the source of burial societies. When we didn't have insurance, we buried Mother Bethel Church in my hometown of Philadelphia in 1783 one of the biggest churches there among free blacks. Uh, the church had its first welfare system in the country where they taxed uh, uh, church members a shilling a week. And, and people who were or destitute who had a crisis could come to the church uh, for, for benefits. But even back then, there were moral requirements to qualify you for help that you could not receive help if your poverty was caused by your own slothfulness or your own misbehavior or corruption and values. So we even had standards at a time and these standards were pervasive. Um, and, and so the church played a critical role in educating our children. Um, we, we talk about, for instance, in the South, the education gap between blacks and in, in, in the turn of the century up until 1940, education gap was three years. Um, eighth, eighth grade for, for whites, fifth grade for blacks. Julius Rosenwald, the white CEO of Sears, partnered with Booker T. Washington. And, and he put up $4 million. The black community and the churches and others raised $6 million and built 5,000 Rosenwald Booker T schools where they were operating with used textbooks on half the budgets of the white schools, but they were able to close the education gap the 19, in, in 1920 to 1940 within six months. And that shows you the rich legacy of the faith community armed with a, uh, an attitude of self-determination. It was Dr. Ch Chuck Swindell said, 10% of who we are is defined by our external circumstances. 90% of who we are is our attitude about the 10%. Black America understood that self-determination, resilience are critical elements to our uplift and many of those were embodied in the churches. Everybody was Christian, even if you didn't go to church. <laughs> <laughs> Your mother would say, 
make sure when you go out, you have clean underwear on. It wasn't just a health issue. It, is to, it, it has to do with the faith. You didn't want to be an embarrassment to the family. But, but again, Governor, people are inspired to change and improve when you show them uh, models of self-reliance and self-sufficiency, they're inspired to change. We should never define anybody by oppression or, or, the, or, or barriers that they face, but the real, the real champions are those who, who score in the face of opposition. And that's why um, we should look for inspiration and how do we apply old values to a new vision. We are finding the same attitudes of self-determination, of resilience, abides in some of the most crime-ridden, drug-infested neighborhoods. If we say that 70% of Black Americans are raising, in these low-income neighborhoods, are raising children that have challenges, it means 30% are not. And in those 30% of the households, you see married couples, married, raising children under the worst conditions but people neither right or left ever go into those communities to study the strengths. That's why at the Woodson Center, we're trying to establish the Center for the Study of Resilience and Perseverance. There's no place where we study the success of people in challenging circumstances, but we got luck. They, those are the real experts, Governor, whose, whose knowledge and experience we're missing. And what we're trying to do at the Woodson Center is capture that. They are the drivers of reform. And particularly low-income Black mothers are against defunding the police. You have, as, as, as Delano Squire, it's one of our scholars, said, all of this race narrative is being driven by guilty white people on the, who are seeking absolution from crimes they never committed and entitled Blacks, elites, who are seeking absolution for injustice they never suffered. Hmm. And it's these elites that are dragging the country down to the point where everything has to be seen through the lens of race uh, and, and critical race theory. I'm looking at a, a training manual from the Department of Education that is being used right now as we speak, as well as American Express Company, Walmart, all of them are going through and saying, just a quote from it, employees are encouraged to turn government agencies into anti-racist um, multicultural organizations are given charts that track health quality of their status, that those who are privileged, I mean, where do we go with this foolishness uh, that it's critical race theory is the new bigotry? I frankly prefer the old fashioned bigotry because it's honest, it's forthright, and it doesn't undermine the self-confidence of Blacks. Nothing is more lethal, Governor, than to convince a people that they are exempt from any personal responsibility. That, to me, is more disabling than any force from outside compelling them to conform because of their race. The worst thing in the world is to have the enemy come from within the person by saying to me, you are not worthy. The only way that black people can compete if we lower the standards. And this is, this is a part of the critical race theory. It's a demand that the, that the problems of black America can be found by getting white America to change. If white America all went to Canada and Europe tomorrow, the challenges facing many of these communities would not go away. I, th I think um, here in Tennessee, and certainly as a governor who wants to who wants to break the cycle of continuous dependence on government for people, because there's no dignity in that, there's no hope in that, there is no accessing the promise of America in that. Trying to find ways to do that, you, you we have in our as our. Um, um, Department of Human Services Commissioner Clarence Carter, who I think is a friend of yours, you've known him for some time, and he and I have talked a lot about uh, the Department of Human Services 
interacts with the most vulnerable of our population and those who need the greatest hand up. Uh, but he has a belief, and I, and I share it, that more expansive government, bigger government programs that perpetuate, I think, um, dependence on government is, in the end, it's not helpful to anyone that if we can take this principle of personal capability and, and believe that the folks that we interact with are capable and that they have, if they choose, choose to and pursue the, the opportunities available to them, that that response, personal choice, that personal responsibility and the confidence and capability that they have will allow them to uh, access this dream. I, you know, I, um, I worked with an at-risk inner city youth program for many years and I met a young man and a lot of people have heard me talk about this story, but I met a young man, a young African-American kid that was 12 years old when I met him. And I, I spent one evening a week, every week with him for five years and continue that relationship on today. And I learned so much about the barriers and the limitations and the, um, the sense that initially when I met him, the sense that his options were very few for him. I think that's one of the things that I realized is that options and choices are incredibly limited uh, for a kid like Adam in the inner city. Uh, but as I began to watch him grow and remind him that he's a very smart, capable, competent young man that if he wanted to, that he could, and if there were removed, if some of these barriers were removed, and, and we'll talk about that in a minute, the, the educational barriers in particular, that he has every opportunity for success that, that, uh, that many kids in this country do. I, I really do believe, my, I mean, my desire is to have people in this state access that dream and walk it out and find uh, meaningful success, whatever that looks like for them. And it's different for everyone. Give me your thoughts a little bit just about expansive government, limited government. You've talked about personal responsibility. Um, what is the role of government? Uh, and as governor, I want to know what you think the role of government is in this solution. Again, looking back in, at, at history, is that when uh, I told you before, when, when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. And that's because they had institutions within those communities. And, and we document in our essays, for instance, when blacks were denied access to hotels and, 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 and property, uh, we, we formed our own. We went to our burial societies in, in the Bronzeville section of Chicago, Illinois, in 1929, there was 700 and, uh, 731 Black-owned businesses. There was 100 million in real estate assets in, in there. The out-of-wedlock birth was under 12% in 1929. The same was true in the uh, other Black Wall Streets in Durham, North Carolina, in the Haytai section. Um, there was a thriving community um, Every, every major hotel, uh, every city had a hotel. The Wallahaji in Atlanta, the Carver and the Calvert Hotels in, in Overtown, uh, Miami, the St. Teresa in, in New York, the St. Charles in Chicago. All of these, and Thomas Sowell documents the fact that poverty was dramatically declining for blacks after Second World War from 1945, it declined about 23%. And then between there to 1960, uh, it, it declined dramatically more. But when the government started its anti-poverty program in, 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 in the 60s, the war on poverty, where over the last 60 years, we spent $22 trillion. 70 cents of every one of those dollars didn't go to the poor, it went to those who served the poor. They ask which problems are fundable, not which ones are solvable. And so we have really then 
created a commodity out of poor people. And so for the past 60 years, poverty in the black community has flattened. And in the face of all this government expenditure, government needs to, so what we have found at the Woodson Center by going into those communities with, when, um, in the 80s, a, there are models of applying old values to new reality. Kenilworth Parkside was in the 80s a, a dangerous public housing project in the city of Washington, D.C., 600 units, 3,000 people. Kimmy Gray, the leader, we work with that leader. She organized a residence into a resident management council throughout the drug dealers, promoted personal responsibility, and as a consequence, uh, 600 kids in 12 years went on to college from that public house. But, and, and then other uh, 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 islands of excellence occurred in Washington, D.C. in the early, late 90s. There was a drug and crime infested neighborhood, Ken, uh, um, Benning Terrace. 90, 53 murders in a five square block area with these two warring factions. We work with the Alliance of Concerned Men. These are five ex-offenders that had the moral authority and, and the influence. They went in, brought those warring factions into our office where we negotiated a truce. And just changing 16 young men converting them from predators to ambassadors of peace through God's grace, they were redeemed and they became protectors. Governor, in 12 years, we didn't have a single crew related murder there. And so we've taken the principles that we learned from this neighborhood based intervention and we have applied it to other cities where these uh, cure, cures are occurring. So we have demonstrated that the answer isn't big professional government coming in, but government should work to be on tap and not on top. And we must invest more in these indigenous institutions that have demonstrated they have the trust and confidence because the answers are in the same zip code as the problem. Yeah. The problem is elitism on the part of both the left and the right prevents us from properly recognizing and utilizing this rich resource within the community that, that, that healing must come from within. They are antibodies and the best way to treat a, he, a sick body is to strengthen its own immune system. And these neighborhood level healing agents, if we could resource them properly, could really result in the transformation of some of the most toxic communities in the country. But the crisis is a crisis of values. It is a, is a, it is a moral and spiritual investment that, that is required, along with economic development. But we must make local people agents of their own uplift mm -hmm. with government. We work with Governor Taft, for instance, in when TANF was changed. We, we, we introduced local government to grassroots leaders all over the state of Ohio. So they became the deliverers of welfare programs to their community. I, I, I really like that. I, um, <clears throat> I mentioned Clarence Carter and you, you two think an awful lot alike. And I do think that we have to find a way to, um, to really provide that uplift and the communities themselves, they understand so much more than anyone else does how it is that we can do that in their community. I, I am a person too, who in part because of my experience with uh, children in, in really difficult neighborhoods, you know, I had a, I had an educator one time tell me, and this was an educator of a, a very, uh, a very exclusive, private school who had taught as well in uh, a, a very uh, low economic income school in a, in a zip code that was underprivileged. And her analysis was that the difference, the children are very much alike. The difference is just in the choices that they have available to them. And I got involved in this kid's educational um, you know, in his school 
and in he was failing every subject when I met him. And ultimately, he found his way into a charter school in that community that created a really different opportunity for him and a different trajectory. It was a choice that was made available to him uh, that previously had not been available, and he had no choice but to be to go into his own school that was that the outcomes were not good. I, I'm a strong believer that we ought to give people choices. They ought to be able to access choices. And you talked about the people in that community. I have found that uh, moms of kids in the inner city, they want their kids to have the same choice that other kids do. And they certainly want them to have more choices than one or more options for success for their kid. What, what is your view and what do you think about and how should we as a, as a state that operates a public school system, how should we advocate for school choice and why does it really matter? Well, it's important, first of all, to, to understand that like in the black community, there has always been a divide between the so-called civil rights leadership on issues of, of choice and education. Only six to eight percent of them support it because they're in bed with the teachers unions. And, and but 60 percent of low income blacks support choice and vouchers in education. And this was evident in the 2018 gubernatorial election for Governor DeSantis in Florida. And people just kind of ignore this. The fact that DeSantis was running against a black mayor, uh, this uh, Gillum. And Gillum and and Gillum brought in President Obama to campaign for him. He brought Oprah Winfrey in to campaign for him. And, there, and they were hostile to and opposed choice in education. Gillum, I mean, uh, DeSantis, by contrast, was a strong supporter of choice and vouchers in education. And as a consequence, 100,000 low-income Black parents voted for DeSantis because, and therefore voted against Oprah and uh, President Obama when DeSantis won by 32,000 32, votes, which meant that these parents broke ranks because they placed the value of their children's education above race, they placed it above partisan politics, and to me, they were making a profound statement that they will no longer be controlled by people who want to manipulate them but they will choose the interests of their children. And I think more people in public office need to look at that as an example of the desire on the part of low-income Black parents to provide the best education for their children. And, and it's interesting that when we, the, 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 the uncomfortable question that the tractors don't seem to be, in our studies, uh, there were five black high schools at the turn of the century. In, in New York, Baltimore, Washington, Atlanta, and New Orleans, five black high schools. They were overcrowded in crumbling buildings. They had used textbooks. Those black high schools had half the budgets of white schools. But according to Dr. Walter Williams' study, every one of those black high schools under those conditions out-tested every white school in those urban centers and southern centers. If we achieved excellence and performance under conditions like this, the question is, why are there education disparities today? So you can't really tie it to racial discrimination. And that's why it is important for us to be moved and, and influenced by fact-based truths. And, and, and the uncomfortable truth is 
when whites were at their worst, blacks were at their best. Well, people need to ask, well, how did those schools achieve what they did using used textbooks, overcrowded classrooms, and a half of the budgets of white schools? I, I think that you, you remind us that the children in our communities, regardless of who they are and the color of their skin or the, uh, the economic status that they have, those children have the capacity. Right. They have a competence. They have the ability. They have everything within them to be successful. We just have to provide them with pathway, with an inspiration, uh, with a reminder, with support, remove the barriers and watch them succeed. I have every belief that our children, all of the children in our community can do that. I, I really am seeking ways for us to unlock that opportunity and that potential to get those things out of the way and to let them accomplish and achieve everything that they can. I, I think we can do it. You certainly inspire me to, um, to believe that and to look at innovative, creative ways in this state to make that possible. I, I care very much about every single one of those kids. I wake up every day thinking how we can I can use my life and we can use this institution of government to uh, truly make life better for them, not just to temporarily make it better for them, but make it better for them in the long run to provide them a pathway uh, that they can find their definition of success. And um, I'm grateful for your inspiration for that. It, I'm very hopeful. I have said many times that I do believe we live in the greatest nation in the world. I do know that we have faults and flaws. Uh, it's a little bit like our own personal lives. I'm, I'm a broken, flawed man who does not, uh, you know, who does not have the answers to everything. But God is a redeemer. You've talked about that. The redemptive nature of God in my life, in our lives, in the life, in the life of our state and our people is powerful. It's part of what it's part of what makes me hopeful, even after the great challenges that we've had in the last couple of years. There are so many things that have come to light that will allow us to capitalize on those challenges and and find ways forward that give these the next generation the opportunity, black and white, the opportunity that that they deserve and the opportunity that is possible for them in this country only in this country. And uh, so our, our best days, I truly believe are ahead of us. And I, I wanna be a part of that for, for, the, for the next generation of Tennesseans. Your words are wise. Your experience is uh, crucial. I appreciate your insight and your thoughts going forward. I would love to continue this dialogue <laughs> and to tap into that to tap into that wisdom as we construct, uh, as we construct plans going forward to improve the lives of the people in our state. Well, really, thank you. We really believe that the best of America is in, in front of us. I and too. I'm a patriot and I'm optimistic about that. But, but uh, we are committed to taking race off of the table. America is facing a moral and spiritual freefall that is consuming our children. Like even in, in Silicon Valley, the highest uh, the, the teenagers, the uh, suicide rate among teenagers in Silicon Valley is six times the national average. Hmm. Children in Appalachia and low-income white communities are dying of overdose of drugs. The leading cause of death in urban centers is homicide. You know, and, and so, the, so what we're doing at the Woodson Center is bringing those moms together who are suffering that because solutions, that our children's lives, there's a moral and spiritual emptiness in the lives of our children 
that's causing them to devalue their life to the point where they'll take their own, they'll take someone else's. And so we're going, we have brought together a consortium of these moms a few weekends ago, and it, it was, it was amazing how spiritually powerful it was. And that's gonna be the nucleus of a movement we're gonna to take to this country. But we've gotta take race off the table because it's preventing us from uh, going in and exploring the deeper challenges that we face. Our problem is not as a race problem, we have a grace problem. <laughs> yeah, I, I, I can concur with that, sir. I've seen that myself i think that we i think that we have a grace problem and to we the do and people are risking their lives to come here right. and 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 we are the greatest nation on the face of the earth and and i think that we need to affirm that and and, uh, and so we're just delighted to join with you governor Thank you. and others like you who want to build on the redemptive spirit of our faith and also the experience of our country in redemption. Um, God has redeemed me um, and given me um, things that I never deserve. Thank God I didn't get what I deserve. <laughs> me as well, sir. Thank you. Thank you for your words. Thank you for the work at the Woodson Center. Uh, I encourage those who are tuned in here to to uh, research that work and to see what great things they're doing there and how they're helping change some of the most challenged neighborhoods in America. Uh, not only is this uh, red, white, and black book a great Christmas present for for uh, uh, someone on your Christmas list, but there are a number of writings that Bob Woodson has has done that have been inspirational. So. We appreciate your joining us today, tuning in. Uh, we will continue these conversations in the future. Thank you. Thank you, Governor, for, for having me.